love when I see those monikers with all the different ways that you could say welcome written on them in all the different languages. I'm so glad to have you all here today for Cultivating Voices live poetry um, for a reading that I hope will brighten your winter or summer day evening, uh, depending on where you are as we are here today to celebrate Black Lives Matter. And I not, this is the end of Black History Month in the United States, but I'm hoping that this is the, the momentum to carry over to celebrate um, the voices of Black and African-American poets throughout, throughout the entire year, every single day. Well, we are here. I'm your host today, Sandy Yanon, author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. I'm joining you today from Old Saybrook, Connecticut. And we have just five outstanding, outstanding feature poets. Well, before I introduce today's poets, a little bit about Cultivating Voices live poetry, we began at the end of March, 2020. We're coming up on our one year anniversary in response to all the shutdowns of in-person venues everywhere. And we've developed into an international, intersectional, intergenerational reading series and poetry community. We are approaching 2,400 members. So we're just a few shy. When I did our my welcome for new members today, we were about six shy of 2,400. We occasionally have a special event and uh, like our recent Laureate Love Fest. And uh, I'm so grateful for all the folks that have participated there, as well as our new book showcases and our live open mics. Well, I hope also that each of you will consider purchasing a book from one of our featured poets or even our folks reading today in the open mic, feel free to flash your book up as I'm always doing with mine um, to uh, give a shout out to yourself so uh, we can help move book sales along for everyone, support you and your presses. Well, I have so much gratitude for today's featured poets their eagerness to answer my request to read today in our celebration of Black Lives Matter, Black History Month. I'll introduce each before they read and then return at the beginning of our second hour for our live open mic. The, the, our five features should be no strangers to you all. They've um, joined us before and um, it is always my pleasure to have them with us. And uh, as I said, I'm very grateful that each of them uh, is joining us today. Well, first reading today is Gary Copeland Lilly. Gary is a North Carolina poet currently living, writing and playing music in the Northwest Peninsula of Washington. His publications include three collections, the most recent being High Water Everywhere from Willow Books. And he has driven every mile of Highway 40. I normally am in the same state as Gary. I try to go to as many readings of Gary's as I can because he is astounding. Um, so I cannot, I cannot think of a better person to start our reading today. Would you please welcome Gary Copeland, Lily. Thank you, Sandy. And it was, it's, uh, I had to say, you know, uh, I've seen this thing just, just grow and I'm glad to be a part of this. Um, but, uh, I want to let you know what every mile of Highway 40 means. Every mile of Highway 40 means this started in Wilmington, North Carolina, you know, and uh, 
and I actually drove across the country, you know, from, so that's from like the Atlantic to the Pacific almost, you know, so that's every mile and stuff of it. So, and I'm saying that because I'm starting off with a, a road poem. Black Heart Blues. I was in a fast car driving hard and that one damn thought rocking my rat motor mind. I was four barreling my Chevy South, a candy red Impala Super Sport, rescued from a farmer's fading barn park when his son flew off to the desert storm, rally wheels and a dirty windshield, 200 horses unrestrained, slow drivers getting the hell out the way. I had been driving juiced up and wired down three hours heading home. The morning air was cool. The highway hum blew through the window, that melancholy whine that you only hear when you're driving alone. Repair work started choking the road and it began to rain a drawl drizzle. The morning traffic creeping through Dixie mist law-abiding citizens seeking the nearest gas station, styrofoam cups or cowboy coffee. There's always the half pot that's still cooking on the burner. Sleep glazed drivers sitting stiff and locked in their own red-eyed existence. And the construction boys in the closed left lane and their steel toed shoes and stiff cart heart jeans, scratching their asses, adjusting their crotches, spitting red man juice into the gasoline and all sheen on the road. I grabbed the jack, drank the last corner, capped it empty, shoved it back behind the seat. And there's the sign, two cardinals on a dogwood branch. Welcome to North Carolina. Home of Jesse Helms is 50 years backwards as the Jim Crow flies. And I was heading home to figure this out. I'm in love with a woman and I can drive foot in the gas tank up the long hill of her heart and not get anywhere. That's the real sign I missed. Her kisses metered out like pocket change made me want to roar my red car home and shout into the open window, I don't know one damn thing. Thank you. Um, the next poem, my next poem is the book of distorted Psalms. When the gospel hour of the dog becomes the time of the wolf and red howls arc across the lonesome valley and shadows fade a desperate night in the liquor houses and restaurants serving factory folks, peanuts and pretzels on the bar, gamblers with loaded dice and marked decks are stacking their paper on the table while long sedans are cooling at the curve. You can ante up, pull a poem from the tomb of your pocket. Just don't say I told you so, but this is where fallen angels go. The smoke from the gypsy turning tyro cars, the smoke Thick as prayers that drift into her front room. We'll flip the cars for customers waiting in wooden chairs to claim their turn. They drink from mason jars they have brought from home to pass the time as quietly as the ash that falls like dust from the burning tip of her cigar. And the embers burn a hole in her tatted carpet as she crushes the cherry tip into the sole of her left shoe. And the folks in the front room, each alone, wait while her cats lick each other in the face. The gypsy front room is crowded. 
and the hoodoo seeps into the tired town on that fleets believing nothing magical ever happens as holy as their weekly resurrection. And that will suffice at least until the rapture comes. And the dead then empty from their graves to catch the blue line train to heaven. And those who are left behind with their corporate jobs will be chain smoking in the back seats of cars, rolling from red light to red light. Don't say, I never told you so. This is where the broken go. This is how they go. Ah, uh, thank you. How I survived my murder. I filtered my drinking water, grew a beard, buzzed my hair to the scalp, swallowed a spoonful of vapor rub, coughed into my elbow. I sheltered in place, didn't go to church. There were no visitors or visits. I obeyed the speed limit. I washed my chapped hands every time I found myself staring at them. I locked the doors. I went incognito. Then I went incognito and secretly stocked up on rice and dried beans. I slept only the daylight hours, gave up pork rinds and cigarettes and continued to smoke weed and drink whiskey at home. From the news, I watched the late, like, late night comedians because I believe in the honesty of humor. I play my guitar on the back porch for the herons. I ate my spinach and licked the plate, and I wear a mask, especially for the police. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with a uh, um, too brief after George Floyd. To suck oxygen into my lungs and expel it. Inhale, exhale. To control the outgoing breath in creating my voice, my stuttered words and the songs I tried to sing. To pause, ask for a breath, to pant, take a rest, to move gently or blow lightly, to smell the air in my mother's flower garden or the kitchen with bread in the oven, to absorb oxygen and perspire as the result of any exertion, to be exposed after being uncorked in order to develop, to live, to simply be allowed to exist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary Copeland, Lily. Um, it's been a member of Cultivating Voices since the very early days a year ago and was definitely um, influenced how we've moved forward um, to strive to be as to be more diverse always and always work on that and always work on that and what that means and I'm really grateful um, for your presence and um, how you've supported this reading series and of course I'm tremendously grateful for your voice and your being in the community of poetry worldwide. Thank you for being with us today. Gary, Kim Ports Parson has been putting um, in the chat where you can purchase um, Gary's books and we will now move to our second feature. Well, Tamara J. Madison was actually with us just a few weeks ago for her new books showcase reading. 
And I'm sure if you were with us uh, a few weeks ago, and if you were with us during our suffrage vote for our votes for women celebration of women's suffrage reading, you, and if you've been anywhere to any of her readings, you never forget hearing Tamara J. Madison read from her new collection, Threed, This Road, Not Damascus. It is an incredible honor for me to have you back in the same month twice and let me share a little more about Tamara. Tamara J. Madison is an author, poet, editor, and instructor. Her critical and creative works have been recorded, produced, and published in various albums, journals, magazines, exhibits, podcasts, and anthologies. Her formats know no boundaries. Wonderful. Her most recent poetry collection is one that I'm most eager to get back to when I'm back in Washington. Not having it has really with me has been very, a little agonizing for me. Her most recent collection is Threed, This Road, Not Damascus, which was published by the wonderful Trio House Press in May, 2019. It's just my real joy and um, honor to welcome Tamara to today's program. Thank you. Hi, Sandy, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Okay. Uh, this is an, um, I'm finagling with settings and trying to get some things right. Forgive me. Okay, there we go. Um, this is a very special occasion for me. Thank you, Sandy, for the invitation to do this again. Um, thank you for continuing this series, for starting it, and for continuing this series in spite of your own challenges these days and things going on when you could have put it on hold, but you haven't. So thank you. Um, I'm going to get through this the best way I can. I have to say that um, Mr. Lilly just read a poem for George Floyd. And I want to say that my section of this reading and this event today is dedicated to the memory of my cousin, Gerald Delaney Martin. And um, we just had the memorial service yesterday. And what I want to share is when you live in a culture and a country where there are so many George Floyds and cases like that, it is a special honor and a blessing, an absolute blessing when you come from a family where there is a black man who is just as dedicated to his history as he is to being a dreamer and a visionary. And my cousin Gerald was a dreamer and a visionary. He didn't feel like he was bound by any history though he honored it. He traveled to other countries. He had homes in other countries. And so to know and have a family member who was the historian, the archivist, as well as the dreamer and the visionary of the family is really important. And I wanna say some of his children are here. There are family members here. And let us not be fooled. There are young people who are very much interested in history and moving things forward. So I wanna thank all of them for being here. So let me get started on the poetry. I'm sorry about that, but I just needed a little minute, right? 
This first piece is in the book three, This Road, Not Damascus. And it is a piece called Prophecy, Maternal Lineage Two. And Cameron, this is the poem that we were talking about in honor of our great, great grandmother just last night, looking at the photo. Prophecy for Melinda. On the back of the photograph, one of my foremothers wrote, this is Melinda. She knew one day, a century later, I would need to find you. Framed in sapia, statuesque and fierce, eyes locked into the camera. You long saw me coming. Grandmama kept you hidden, fearing you'd blotch her milky skin, mar her Christian countenance. Uncle says you were native, corn cob pipe smoking Indian. Others say you moor, descendant of the originals who first tamed Turtle Island. Textbook and the scripture twisted your legacy into caricature, caricature. But me, I say, the way you stand there in your Sunday dressed best, staring across generations at me, daring me to be free. Mm -mm. Miss Melinda, Madam, you were never anybody's, anybody's slave. For Melinda. The next piece is called Poet's Arrival. And Poet's Arrival is me descending from my lineage. Ripped the foreskin of my father's dreams, thrust from ragged wounds, nursed on battered breasts, whispered from my mother's severed tongues. Here I come, here I come. Blood rush, honed bone, swaddled in thorny brine, brimstone my bed my pillow, a pillar of salt, my father's muffled moans, my mother's shrieking eyes, my lullaby. I wanna say just really, really quickly, um, I chose pieces that were not historical, but pieces about everyday people because we have to remember that every single decision that we make and everyday people make history every single day, right? And there are many names that get forgotten. So this piece is simply called Poet Thinks of Home. All right. I come from cast iron skillets from griddles grease popping and Dutch oven loving, from the one story house with 10 story dreams, struggling to pay all the bills on time. I come from blues grass and dandelions, the maple tree weeping as the lifeless body swings and hope moans. I'm from choir rehearsals and usher board trainings, from Papa Daddy and Grand Grand. I'm from Be Still Now and Watch Your Mouth, from I Brought You In This World, I Can Take You Out. I'm from Jesus Loves Me at the Altar and Keep Your Knees Together in the Pew with Sticky Thighs, for the Bible tells me so. I'm from Jack's and spades and record players on the porch with corn roll customers waiting in line from bottle cap guns and dust bowl tournaments and the bicycle posse headed for the new pool. 
I'm from hide and go seek, go get it. Better not get caught. Have my tail in the house before the street lights came on. I come from the pulpit and the projects. Sunday dinners and Kentucky bourbon, Baptist town, Lincoln Avenue, Oak Grove glory, hot water, cornbread, turnip greens, and butter beans. I'm from daddy surviving. The KKK donned in clan belts with their city fire, fire uniforms. I'm from holy Bibles with births, deaths, prayers engraved. I'm from lost names and tribes found. Their visions yet living waters, my soul baptized. The last two pieces I wanna share are actually based on historical pieces that we know of. And I wanna to mention to all of the writers out there, I was commissioned um, a year or so ago to write a poem for a uh, art exhibit for a poet that, for a writer, I'm sorry, that I didn't know by the name of Nella Larson. And she was a little known writer of the Harlem Renaissance. And so this piece was written for her and it is called Meteorology for Nella Larson. A pale sky spits, swallows a dark cloud. I am conceived. Dixie's contradiction, sin without contrition. Yellowed, never gold. Silver, never sterling. The coveted lining, Never, only thinning shell, veined with fractures, cracks, quaked my bones, fevered the marrow, never fitting, always shorn, never passing, always failing the criteria. Behold me, the eternally stifled, toiling, beneath a battered horizon, the flanking gray, neither cloud nor sky, though brewing morass asunder, thunder holding its breath, lightning poised with clenched teeth, bruised the skin of the wind, the cacophonous quiet kept, never calm, me, storm perfect. The last piece I wanna share is, um, I wanna say it was inspired by um, Marilyn Nelson's book, A Wreath for Emmett Till. And it was also inspired by Bernice McFadden, McFadden excuse me, A Gathering of Waters. And both of those books were inspired. One is, the first is a poetry book, the second is a novel and they were both inspired by Emmett Till. And I wrote this piece in honor of he and his mother and for the many who were slain and senselessly uh, lost because sometimes we get so caught up in the tragedy that we forget the actual lives of these people. So this piece is simply called Till Poem and this is my last piece. We have buried you so many times sifted through files and notes, slipped our fingers through cracks and crevices to find some semblance of sense, justice. Why? Praying it soothe us, lay you finally to rest. Still our palms and hearts echo canyons barren Instead of sorting through the puzzle pieces of your death, I want to crown you, Mamie's baby, with a life poem. Emmett, oh, you amber-eyed, butterscotch, shy, slick, black boy with the tripping back into your step, that Midwest
swagger showing off in front of all them country bumpkin boys. I want to write you sliding into home base with dusty Mississippi money, painting your backside, bringing a cheering crowd to its feet. I want to write you a 14 year old grin of innocence wearing mannish mischief for cologne. I want to write you lip smacking, trembling shudder after the bubble gum kiss first kiss from a little brown black girl where it is safe safe and sweetness steals the breath of blues in the Mississippi air. I want to write that crack back into your voice, Emmett, as hair begins to appear in the strangest places of that landscape called your body. Your beautiful brown black body that brown black body that ran Chicago concrete with Mississippi grass whistling against the soles of your feet. I want to write you running, Emmett, free back to the sun of Mamie's face, shining with pride and promise, running until you slammed into her body, warm dough, your face buried in the rise of her bosom, your brown black face recording the beat of her heart that followed after you and you alone in it because you were her only. I want to write your first catch in that mitt, your first swish in the net, your first flitting fish on a hook, your first words, your first teetering steps, your first fall, first crawl, your first tooth and chew, Emmet. I want to crown, wreath you, your first cry, your first open eyes, yet womb wet, bleeding light, bleeding life, Fearless, fearless, fearless in it. Thank you. I don't unmute myself quickly so I can, you know, sometimes the silence is necessary. So I like to take that brief pause. You know, I don't have words other than to say thank you. So much gratitude for the poems and um, of course, what a way to honor your cousin today and your family. And um, I will, yeah, I just, uh, folks, I hope that if you do not have three, this road, not Damascus in your collection, that you will not waste any more time and get that book into your collection today. <laughs> Um, I also want to share with you, there's a tremendous book um, called The Blood of Emmett Till, and I'm sorry that I can't give you the name of the author, but it's a really power, it, it quotes many, many things from um, Mamie's book that she wrote um, about Emmett herself. And uh, I highly, really recommend people checking in with the history of Emmett Till if you're not familiar. And that book would be a very good entry point for you, The, the Blood of Emmett Till. Maybe, maybe Kim might look it up for me and put it in the chat. Tamara, thank you so much. And again, much love to you and your family. And I'm so grateful for you being here today.
spent every day. These poets on Cultivating Voices live poetry, I just, I really, I really have just come to love all of you so much. And um, whenever I get to meet, whenever I've met you, um, and again, I'm so grateful every time that happens. And our next poet, Martina McGowan, um, is going to be reading in a couple of weeks in her uh, new, their new book showcase coming up. Um, and I'm so excited because um, your book, we had a preview when you read from I Am the Rage and you in fact read the title poem and I hope folks will come out in droves for your new book showcase to um, give you the love for that journey to produce your collection. And, and uh, we applaud you and um, for that journey and for sharing it with us. Let me say the more formal bio, Martina McGowan, I should say Dr. M Martina McGowan, MD, is a physician gynecologist who has spent a lifetime engaged as a survivor and activist fighting against social, racial, and sexual injustices while serving the underserved and underrepresented. Her debut poetry collection and I think Don had, Don showed it to us. You might be able to flash it up on the screen. Her debut poetry collection, I Am The Rage, was released earlier this month, published by Source Books. It is a poetic and poetic prose exploration of living inside injustice. We welcome you. Martina, and thank you for bringing your work to the forefront for all of us to hear. Thank you very much, Sandy. And thank you, Don, for the invitation. Um, my condolences to you and your family tomorrow. Thank you for that wonderful read. And you are indeed a tough act to follow, <laughs> but I will give it my best shot. Um, to begin my own portion of this program, I'm actually going to read from one of my own poetic heroes before I start reading my own stuff. Um, A Litany for Survival by Audre Lorde. For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone. For those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going in the hours between dawns looking inward and outward at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths so their dreams will not reflect the death of our own. For those of us who were imprinted with fear like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy footed hoped to silence us for all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. My next poem is fairly new. It's, it's, um, it was written around the time of um, Breonna 
Fiona's Murder is probably one of four that I wrote. This is not the one in the book, although there is one in the book. Let us be clear. This, is, this life was not lost, but was taken because someone felt they had the right. Enduring manacles, imprisoning every one of us in a system of injustice we seemingly cannot or will not change. Bored with the endless discourse on the lives of color while showing little reservation in eradicating them. It makes us ask, why are some lives important whilst others are merely fodder for bullets, for writing, scenes of blood seeping into carpets and streaming down sidewalks? This life was not lost, not lost in a battle for cancer, not carelessly misplaced or accidentally dropped like a piece of lint slipping out of your back pocket, taken like Cain's original sin, one we've not outgrown, leading to protests and burning, more lives lost, more lives taken in payment of a callous judgment and an inconsequen inconsequential price someone has placed on lives that do not matter. This next poem is called Rabbit Hole. Jet lagged and carbon dated, we traverse the oceans in darkness, still appearing younger than we are and feeling so much older than we have any right to feel. Markings, lashings, and brandings. We are the tribe that will outlast your animosity, the tribe you can never destroy, nor we you. So we will press on together, reflexively and reflectively, incorporating every lesson in hate and yes, even in love. Turn the historical page or gaze into your crystal ball and we will still be standing there looking back at you, part and partial of who you are, who you think you have become, who you wish you had become, Ed. a nation built upon a rainbow of backs, brown, red, black, yellow, and yes, even a few unfortunate whites. Let us continue down this rabbit hole together, hand in glove, thick as thieves, even if I am the only one ever labeled a thief. These last two are from the book. Um, if I had chosen another poem as the anchor poem, it would be this one. It's called, There is Too Little Time. There is too little time to teach our children that there is no after to this ubiquitous feeling that life is but a stream trailing from our bodies, almost unseen. There is too little time to spoon feed our children, giving them false hope and false hype while trying to convince ourselves that the world can be full of wonder and fair, but they are not free to hold it. There is too little time to teach our children that the fairy light touch can quickly turn into the bite of a policeman's club. There is too little time to teach our children to say I to all that life has to offer and to every passing whim knowing it will never be offered to them. There is too little time to teach our children to fight to keep their spirits free, the insignificance of a hope for tomorrow, managing the lives of apostles and apostates alike, the sweetness of oranges, the tiny moments that make life sweet, the defiance built into their very DNA. There is too little time to allow our children to be children. Thank you. And this final poem is I Am the Rage. It is the anchor poem for the book. I am the rage, roiling just beneath the surface. I am the dream deferred again. I am the promises needed and repeated, but never kept. I am the air between light and dark. Flames that burn, that burn but can I be consumed nor satisfy its own abiding hunger. I am the glowing embers you continue to poke and prod with meanness that bubbles over on tweets. I am the ravenous appetite to destroy something, anything. I am the ever-present clanking chains in the belly of the cargo hold, struggling to love myself, a thing you have taught me to loathe. I am the days in the inky skies. I am the niggardly feeling that there is not enough, will never be enough, money, land, 
freedom, education, life to satisfy us all. I am the outrage that flares every time you say something foolish like, I thought you were already free. I am disappointment that breathes hot and silent every time I am dismissed, discharged, dishonored, cast aside, counted as worthless or meaningless. I am the melody that lies inside every Negro spiritual that sings praises of diminishing hopes in this life and a brighter, fairer world in the next. I am the mother who wields the belt that cuts both ways, that beats my children in hopes that you will spare their lives. I am the salty tears of anxious mothers, frightened each time her child crosses the threshold, praying for a return that is not guaranteed, like payment of some impossible garnishy on lives we want for them. I am the furthest point from you, thrashing about in the sea of doom, gasping for air. I am the dark fiber that runs through our shared history that will not allow you to forget, a constant reminder to us both that I can never go home, can never find home. I am the rage running unbridled streets. I am the fire this time. I am the rapacious thirst seeking justice for all on these dusky days and obsidian nights. I am rage that lives in the powder keg of unfilled, unfulfilled lives awaiting the spark. I am the rage. I am the lost sheep. I am the muted prayer that we will see each other clearly one day. Thank you. Sometimes I have to take that pause again, of course. Um, thank you. Um, Martina, I want to remind you folks, please mark your calendars um, because Martina will be showcasing I Am the Rage on our, in our new book showcase on May 9th. Mark the calendar now. What's stopping you? But get the book. So you can follow along. And of course, thank you for sharing Audre Lord, the Litany for Survival, remind which reminding me that what she said, which is that poetry is not a luxury. Um, that's you know what the the name of one of her essays in uh, Sister Outsider. It's a it's a it's a book that I never. I literally do not leave home without it. I brought it with me to Connecticut because I can't not have this book with me. Um, I brought five books with me. That was one of them. So I'm really happy to be able to um, share with you in lifting her voice today and the legacy that she's left and uh, that you share and I thank you for sharing it so eloquently today. We continue with our powerful readers. I, I knew, I mean, I knew, I knew what, what I was inviting to come to, for, to share for us to be able to hear and deeply listen today. Uh, it's very, very intentional um, that we do this. And I'm again, so grateful for all of our featured readers and those folks who are gonna be reading in the open mic. Before I introduce our next reader, I'm going to post for you all. There's the names of the folks in the open mic. We ha we'll do 15 readers, three minutes each, one poem up to three minutes. Our next poet joining us today from the upper Midwest is Lauren Russell. And uh, Lauren Russell's new collection, Descent, is another book of, of personal 
political and historic consequence of her and her family's journey through time. And Don Krieger recommended this book to me. He said, you must read this book. In fact, you must read it so much. He sent it to me because he said, you know, I'm not going to wait around for you, Sandy, to get it. <laughs> I'm sending it to you. And I was so um, astounded by what I read in the pages of that book and how Lauren crafted this poetic narrative. And I couldn't be more grateful than to have um, her return to uh, share her work with us today, whether it's all from um, dissent or not, uh, just her voice, uh, a clarion call for all of us. Well, Lauren Russell's first full length book, What's Hanging on the Hush, came out from Ashanta Press in 2017. Her second book, Descent, is the winner of the 2019 Tarpaulin Sky Book Awards and came out from Tarpaulin Sky Press in June of 2020. A 2017 National Endowment for the Arts Creative Writing Fellow in Poetry. She has also received fellowships from Cave Canem, the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing, and Vita the Home School. Her work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day, and the anthologies, Bettering American Poetry, 2015, and Furious Flower, Seeding the Future of African American Poetry, among many other publications. From 2016 to 2020, she was the assistant director of the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics at the University of Pittsburgh. And this fall, she joined the faculty at Michigan State University as an assistant professor and director of the Residential College Arts and Humanities Center for Poetry. Would you please welcome Lauren Russell? Hi, can everybody hear me? Great. Thanks, Sandy. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Don. It's really an honor to be um, in this lineup and hear all these wonderful poets. So um, thank you so much for including me. I am going to read a little bit from Descent, but I'm first going to read a couple other things. Um, I really love the idea of reading a poem by another Black poet, but I couldn't decide. <laughs> I had a hard time deciding what to read. And then this morning I thought of this poem by Sonia Sanchez. Um, it's called Fall, but because it's just starting to appear to be spring or a little bit fall spring in Michigan, the sun's sort of been out. Um, I was thinking of this poem. So this is um, Sonia Sanchez from Shake Loose My Skin. Fall. I have been drunk since summer, sure you would come to sip the waves until they flaked like diamonds over our flanks. I have not moved even when wild horses with snouts like pigs came to violate me. I squatted in my baptism. Oh, hear the sea galloping like stallions toward spring. Um, and then I'm going to read this poem. It's called Are We Not Obsidian? And the title is after the Ellen Gallagher ex ex exhibit, Are We Obsidian? Um, from 2019. And it's dedicated to Becca Zela M. Gooney and Soretta Morgan, who did a workshop um, that prompted the question at the end. So, Are We Not Obsidian? This is not the death I dreamed of, so it must be life. Red moon bullseye playing peekaboo with the idea of a cloud. 
a black bird vessel sprouting porcelain feathers. It's spouting steam, can't hiss, so it chuckles. Coo, 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 some relentless heckler. I never wear black, but it's wearing me down. So many weights and shades playing peekaboo with the idea of a shroud. Black velvet, charcoal, cigarette ash, newsprint, rubber, black sponge, black lace, black paint flaking, recalcitrant, black ink overcrowding the loose leaf. Out of the black, I carve portholes with a view of more black. Out of the view, I scoop lakes lined with black tar and burlap. Red moon bullseye plays peekaboo with the idea of a cloud. I never wear black, but it's wearing me down. The politicians in blackface croon, coo, 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 rehearsing a round for the six o'clock news. This is not the death I swaddled, so it must be life. A blackbird vessel sprouting porcelain feathers cackles a jingle into the night. I want to dance with a hematite ghost, flat hatted shadow sneezing smoke. She's burning a fleet of funereal boats. She dips and billows, she spurs, my pulse sings. How can black lives matter and not your own? Um, and now I am gonna read a few poems from Descent. I hope it's not redundant. To those who, um, cause I did, I did read some of them in the um, showcase a few months ago, but it is also black history. So the backstory here is, um, 2013, I acquired a copy of the diaries of my great great grandfather, Robert Wallace Hubbard. He was a captain in Hood's Texas Brigade in the Civil War. And after the end of the war, went back to East Texas and had children by three of his former sisters, three of his former slaves who were also sisters, um, misspeaking there. Um, and as I was typing this 225 page diary, which took me a year, I became really fascinated by what was being left out um, and started researching and writing into that space. So one of the three sisters he had children by was my great great grandmother, Peggy Hubbard. His name was Bob or Robert. Dear Robert, dear Redbeard, dear specter of the great white father, Dear slaveholder, dear Confederate captain captured at Gettysburg, dear dispenser of land, favor, seaman, procreator of 20 children by three sisters simultaneously, dear father of the Negro League pitcher, dear farmer, schoolmaster, landlord, hired hand, grave paler, log roller, surveyor, and manure shoveler, dear singer, dear churchman and circus fan, Dear reveler at brigade reunions, dear collector of sentimental poems about loneliness and redemption, dear pointy eared like Lucifer and bearded beyond Rasputin, dear mythical Jim Crow defier, hero of my grandfather's childhood, who took him on the whites only section of the streetcar. He claimed this really happened, proclaiming these are my grandchildren and they're sitting with me. Dear diarist, dear widower, dear lonesome hunger, dear admirer of well-formed women, dear inscrutable in the tin type beside your favorite half-claimed child, dear tallier of payments, debts, work days, weather conditions, neighbors by name and race, dear borer of wells, dear master of omission, Heard a whippoorwill holler this morning for the first time this spring. Heard a whippoorwill holler, all hands choking cotton. Heard a holler, a whimper. Heard a will whip her. 
Will heard a whip, whip or will. Will heard, herding herds, whipping herds, sowing oats, whipping whores, stripping cane or Whelped her, willed her a well and a hold, dank of the dark of the hell of the hold. Choking cotton, caught in, a yoke and a pull, stripped and caned for. Heard her holler, caught her, held her hand to the, whipped out your, held her head to the, whipped out the billfold. Heard a whimper this spring, choke door. Heard a holler, a hollowed out hold, whipped to a wheelbarrow, hell bent toward a hole, ripped from a wrapped in a gut wrench sugar hold. Question. So how did the women feel about this? Answer. Don't guess they had no say. And again, my great great grandmother's name was Peggy. Peggy rises out of sleep through the dream called blue, where all her kinfolks are wading through fields of blue. Even her father left in Georgia, her stillborn brother somehow grown, her niece who stumbled into the fire on Christmas day and died with the vision of her white dress aflame, the aunt or uncle who ran off or was lost forever to the auction block. They are all wearing blue, blue hats, blue shawls, and in the way they sing a song with no words deep from the gut, there is also blue. And bluely she creeps toward them in her calico blue. And now there is a dance, they are partnering for the quadrille and the man they called Bo Peep cradles a banjo, strikes a tune blue. And her petticoat starched with hominy water and prisses too. And every time they stop moving for a second, the petticoats pop and Pris giggles and in Pris's eyes are flecks of blue. The log train shakes her into waking, black then dark blue. And she reaches for her kerchief blue and she is stumbling toward the cradle blue and cooing shoo shoo to the baby who is hollering now. One Sunday, the preacher prayed, Lord, let us all go to heaven where there'll be no log train. Hoo, 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 and a clankety clank, who's black smoke curling into the half blue. One of um, Bob Hubbard's 20 children was the Negro League pitcher, Jesse Hubbard, who was called Mountain. Um, and all the language in this pantoum is taken from, um, it wasn't exactly a transcription, but it was like um, an interview was done with him in the 70s. The actual recording was lost. And then around 2010, a book was published that had um, not exactly a transcription of the interview, but based on the language really seemed convincing to me based on how my older relatives in Texas talk and how my grandparents talk. So I'm inclined to believe it was authentic. Anyway, the language is from that. Jesse Mountain Hubbard. Man, I beat those guys so bad it was pitiful. The team that wanted me was the Tigers. They didn't sign me because Ty Cobb was there and he didn't like colored no kind of way. The team that wanted me bad was the Tigers. If Cobb saw us coming, he sat out the game. He didn't like colored no kind of way. He gripped the ball tight and bug his eyes. If Cobb saw us coming, he sat out the game. They used to accuse me of cheating, of cutting the ball. He'd grip the ball tight and bug his eyes. Well, I had something I could cut it with. They used to accuse me of cheating, of cutting the ball. If they threw drop balls in front of the plate, I'd kill them. Well, I had something I could cut it with. All I did was pull up my pants like this. If they threw drop balls in front of the plate, I'd kill them. Now that's part of the history of the Negro race. All I did was pull up my pants like this. When I got warmed up real good, I cut loose on them. Now that's part of the history of the Negro race. They didn't sign me because Ty Cobb was there. When I got warmed up real good, I cut loose on them. Man, I beat those guys so bad it was pitiful.
last one. Peggy. That moon ain't hiding, clouds a shawl. Moon's cold as brass tacked upside a night's frock. Pin your tears to her, they'll sing like chimes or ghosts that cry. Sometimes I feel I'm almost gone. Ghosts charred in dead men's lust. Think I'm some fool, got brains of shucks. Since freedom I've been through the toughs. See one moon cast your shadow twice, once toward the bottom land, once toward the pines. The wind's right smart, but moon, she sly. Look, lightning bugs, they spark, but they cannot catch fire. Thank you. Well, Lauren, thank you so so much um the craft of the poems i mean is just astounding the pantoum and using the forms they're, they're so brilliant and and the form of the form of the book um if i if honestly i you know i years ago when i was at the university of nebraska i taught thomas and beulah because it was such a i felt it was such an accessible book and i knew that um, the students at Nebraska were not likely getting much exposure to the full history. Um, and I thought that Rita's Dove's book was a, was a book to help do that. And um, the ne next time, I don't teach poetry, um, but I, I would, if the next time, if I do, if I ever do, again, um, I, for, the, for that same reason that I taught um, Thomas and Beulah, Descent would be a book that I would absolutely want to put on the syllabus um, for that, in that same way. And I, I, I really do hope that, that um, folks are teaching it across the country. Um, Thank you again for being with us today. And I look forward to the next time we're in each other's company. Well, our final feature today before we move to the open mic is Dee Allen. And Dee Allen, as um, I like to share, was one of the, one of the first four people to ever read in our new book showcase, um, when we when we began that feature in cultivating voices live poetry in July, so it is always it is so so I you know I, I I'm I'm weird I like the little rituals of of remembering when a person read and and um, and many of them having these really special places in my mind and my heart and my soul and. Um, not to mention D's Allen. D Allen's voice is really on when you hear D Allen's poetry, like you are hearing, you are hearing a voice unlike any other. Um, I, I I love listening to to um, his work. Well, let me go to the formal bio without further ado, and a reminder that after D, we will move to the live open mic. And here is my little cheat sheet. Where are you? <laughs> okay. A few little technical difficulties, no worries. It's just me trying to, there we go. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm shaken by the, by the day, the amazing day of poetry. All right, D. Allen is an African-Italian performance poet based in Oakland, 
California. We, we've really been all over the states today, across um, west to east. We've been everywhere today. Um, Dee Allen is an African-Italian performance poet based in Oakland, California, active on the creative writing and spoken word tip since the early 1990s. He is the author of five books, Boneyard, Unwritten Law, Storm Water, and Skeletal Black, all from Poor Press, and his newest from Conviction to Change Publishing, Eloi Unitsi, and 36 anthology appearances under his figurative belt so far. I love the so far because I know what that means. Much more to come. Would you please welcome Dee Allen. Shorn. Getting the head shorn with a blade, hairless to the touch and smooth. Was how Kenyan and Tanzanian Maasai men historically prepared for battle against approaching hostile nearby tribes. Nowadays, Maasai women strip themselves of woolly hair for cleanliness and drawing the straying male eye on them as an African man. In America, applying a good razor to my stubbly scalp, lathered in thick white cream, backwards and forwards, before the bathroom mirror over a face bowl, keeps the creeping ravages of gray from settling in all too soon. Or so I tell myself, my face, all sharp corners and high cheekbones receives the same treatment. My ritual wards off age for the time being, youth and cleanliness maintained by razor strokes. This is me in warrior mode, preparing for battle against encroaching hostile Western society. That poem was called Shorn. And the next poem comes from my third book, Stormwater Poems, 2012 to 2016. I'm doing two pieces from here. From pages 15 and 16, this is an ekphrastic poem, one of those pieces inspired by artwork, in this case, a painting. This is called The Forbidden Act. And to assist me in this endeavor, I'm going to use the share screen function. The Forbidden Act. An oil painting on a coffee shop wall in Sacramento told a compelling story, albeit innocent on the surface. Georgia, 1837. After a long day's work cleaning the landowner's mansion and waiting on his privileged family hand and foot, two black slave women returned to their cabin at sundown, lit some candles, and engaged in an act illegal in all southern states. One slave woman of braided hair reached for a hardcover book she smuggled from the mansion one day. The other slave woman with glasses and snow white head shawl sat in a rocking chair ready for her lesson. One slave woman led the tutorial. The other slave woman was led through two open book pages, lush garden paths of new words, new phrases, sentences, paragraphs that would throw the landowner, the overseer, and their way of life off balance if they were ever repeated aloud. New words, new phrases, sentences, paragraphs, signs of life outside the plantation. And the more the seated slave woman's eyes scan the open book pages before, the more those tight metal shackles began to unlock within her mind. And suddenly she was finally free. If only her work-worn body would follow. By flickering candlelight, two black slave women plotted their quiet escape from bondage, lifelong darkness, through the most forbidden act 
of reading. And that poem was called The Forbidden Act, inspired by the painting Learn Me to Read by Long Beach-based painter Akinsanya Kambon. I cannot find the original painting online anymore. So that black and white photo from the 19th century was the closest thing to it. It was prob the painting was probably inspired by that picture for all I know. And another poem from Stormwater from pages 34 and 35 in the book. And this is based on actual events. Get ready to see something patently offensive. This one is called Rebel X. You wear your X and I'll wear mine, exclaimed a controversial t-shirt back in the Clinton years. A short open letter addressed to the Nubian race showcased a battle flag, the other red, white, and blue, flown in field skirmishes of an ancient war between split American states, North and South. The last Rhodesian in South Carolina, Dylan Storm Roof, had his ex pledged allegiance to it lovingly before he opened fire on nine black people in the Charleston Chapel. The spirit of Dynamite Bob worked through him that Sunday morning. Signifying secondhand separation and hate passed off as honor and heritage, popular amongst Southern metalheads and gun freaks and the Ku Klux Klan the Rebel X. Two more pitches for you. The Courage Award shouldn't go to an athlete, but a woman who with both hands scaled up a courthouse flagpole and removed from the top South Carolina's historic shame. Emblem of oppression keepsake of a lost cause, banner of racism, reminder of slavery. Her action indeed took courage in a state whose whiter populace would rather see its blacker half back in chains. General Lee's seal, stars and bars, the Southern Cross, the Rebel X. And that poem was called Rebel X, which was full and about the courageous act of this woman here. Meet Bree Newsom, the South Carolina-based news reporter and activist who took a bold move and scaled up the courthouse flagpole in Columbia, South Carolina, and tore down that Rebel X clean off for the whole world to see. That symbol of that symbol of white supremacy, that reminder of slavery for all of my people. And the last poem I'm going to do is about a historical figure who never, who almost never gets talked about, but she played a big role in the Black Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s anyway. And I have three pictures for that. Oh. The inspiration for the next poem came from this old black and white picture from 1963. This is called Race Street. These new dark ages, when rebellion against the mo aggressive sex is offered in the Women's March, Me Too, and MMIW in holding darkness, pussy grabbing nightmares at bay, could use bolder heroes. Someone like her, natural born fighter, risen from the comfortable middle class, Howard University educated, marching down National Guard occupied race street, Cambridge, Inc., Maryland, June 1963, on her way to the courthouse with 
249 other marchers on their way to bury Jim Crow. The National Guardsman raised his bayonet high and sharp, aimed for her still beating heart. Swift replies, a hard look on her face, her brushed hand to deflect, attempt to silence her completely, to deflect military martial law, to deflect enforced racial separation, to deflect turning the other cheek for any man. Nonviolence would have gotten bodies beat in their pursuit of dignity. Self-defense took precedence within that movement for black lives. The dividing line between black and white vanished when black power was born on race street. These new dark ages could use bolder heroes. Someone like her, the one most tend to forget, who fought two struggles, to be black and free, to be woman and assertive. Mrs. Richardson, outspoken, direct, defiant, and emerged every time after her clashes with white male power, glorious. And that last poem was called Race Street, which happens to be about this person here. Meet Gloria Richardson as she looked back in the day when she was a civil rights leader in her own Cambridge, Maryland, and fought against the unjust Jim Crow laws in her town. And even Martin Luther King had offered to help her and her group out. But she's like, we got this, we okay. And besides, she was more of an adherent of Malcolm X anyway. And I have one more picture to show you, if I could pull it up real quick. And this is Gloria Richardson now. She will be 90, she will be 97 this year. Always down for the good fight. Always against racism and white supremacy in any form. This is one of my heroes right here. From this computer mic to yo ears, I'm D. Allen. Thanks for listening. Every month is a time to honor Black history. Every month is a time to celebrate the achievements of women. The first time I heard D. Allen, he was speaking truth to power and Every time I hear D. Allen, D. Allen is speaking truth to power and also connecting with history, the history that we know, the history that's been silenced and the history that has not been lifted. Um, we go back to, you know, Lauren being doing that tremendous work to bring the stories to to bring the stories to the forefront, go back to Gary, um, every, every single one of our readers today, speaking truth to power and bringing history to bringing history forward. Thank you so much. We've heard from our features. We've just heard from the incredible D. Allen. And we began our poetry celebration of Black Lives Matter and Black History Month with Gary Copeland Lilly, 
Tamara J. Madison, Martina McGowan, and Lauren Russell. Look for information about how to purchase their books in the chat. Thanks again to Kim for providing that today for us. And please consider purchasing at least one title today to support these incredible poets and their presses. Um, honestly, my friends, if I had the resources, I would buy each of you a copy of all of their books and give and gift them to you today. If I win the lottery, come back to me and call upon me to do that because I, I, I couldn't imagine a better, <laughs> I couldn't imagine a better gift than the work of our five features today. And it is with immense gratitude um, to all of you for your time, your humanity, your truth, your power, and your sharing the past and history, which um, as Ivan Boland talks about a lot is not the same thing. The past and history are very different. And I appreciate you bringing both as well as the current moment to today's Zoom stage. Well, we're gonna shift to the live open mic and we have 15 readers. Um, I'm going to put in the chat again, our 15 readers for today. And a reminder that each of our open mic readers will be reading one poem up to three minutes, their own or the work of, 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 of a black poet they admire. And we will begin with Amit Dahiyash Badsha, where it's very, very, very early in the morning or very, very late in the evening, depending on upon how you look at it. And following Amit will be Susie Crandall. Thank you, Susie. Uh, Sandy, what a what a what a night of poetry, what a morning. Uh, my offering is a poem called "Black or White." It was written in Philadelphia in 2004. I was walking on the banks of the Shurkil River, and I sat down to write a poem about 8:30 in the morning. And this drunk. A uh, person came up to me and asked me the strangest question of my life. He said, would you be white or black? And uh, this poem is called White or Black. Today, someone asked me if I were white or black. My mind went blank. Not white blank or black blank but surprise blank, mystified blank. A touch curious blank, even a little furious blank. I was bemused blank. When I was alone, I looked at my hand. I am wheat, the color of food for thought. I am from India where there are a thousand shades of human skin not just white or black, or the shades between. And the color of my skin stretches across your great divide, like a bridge over troubled waters. Your emotional landscape, like a woods in winter, polarized permanently into a world of white and black. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amit. Our next reader is Susie Crandall, followed by 
Jesse Ramos Cruz. Hello. Um, <clears throat> I wrote this um, in response to events earlier this year in the US and um, just try to sort of capture the sense of the confusion, my feelings, and some generalized disgust. This is called January 6, 2021. Belated outrage at what passes for supremacist muscle, its rotted white alabaster cracked and crumbling who knows what it will take to staunch the wound of not enough bread for that circus, not enough love in the world to turn that worm. While the owl circles the sacred chamber, calling roll meticulously, reminding us of endings. A rudimentary show of hands indicates absence. Aphasic voices rising in a cloud of meaningless uncertainty. These days, there is nothing to hold on to as the blood slips through our fingers onto the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie Crandall. And up next is Sylvia Ramos Cruz, followed by Jesse Ehrenberg. Yes, can you hear me? Wonderful. So I'm reading a poem today by Anita Scott Coleman who is an African-American woman who lived between 1890 and 1960. She actually spent the first third of her life here in New Mexico near Silver City, where she went to college in 1909, graduated as a teacher, and then taught and wrote essays and poetry, uh, many of which won prizes. Uh, she is considered part of the Harlem Renaissance, although she is not known as well. But her poetry is really wonderful. And I hope you will all uh, look her up. Uh, I'm, right, I'm reading a poem today that I am sorry is still uh, sadly pertinent and relevant because this is, I don't know when she wrote it, but it must be at least, uh, oh, let's say 50 years ago. And we're still in the same issue. So the title of the poem is Freedom is a Borning Still. Freedom is being born still. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. Freedom is this nation's destiny. To this we are dedicated. Slow are the birth pangs of a nation's travail. Freedom is a borning still. Lesser nations scorn us. That opulent with nature's bounty and fat with sloth and greed, we sleep in the face of wrong and stand behind the barred doors made fast by our own hands like mendicants in fear of losing alms. All the while our kindred torment little children and stifle the cries of Lord, our Lord, that rise from sable throats. Slow are the birth pangs of a nation's travail. Freedom is a warning still. And that government by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sylvia Ramos Cruz. Always, always a pleasure to be in your company. And next is Jesse Ehrenberg. Thank you. Uh, all right, um, this is a poem I wrote about the insurrection. We all may remember that. It's called, Had They Been Black? 
Had they been black or Asian or native or any minority at all, you know that the Capitol guards would never have been unprepared, would never have smiled and taken selfies with them. And later when they gained control, you know there's no way they would have just let them leave and go home. Had they been black, there would have been no restraint, no lack of coordination. The sky would have been filled with military helicopters and the ground covered with tanks, soldiers and riot police. Had they been black, it would have been slaughter. But it was a white riot, so word was passed down to handle with care. Because after all, it was just a few of America's favored children misbehaving. And since there was no real damage done, aside from those beaten and killed, these newly appointed defenders of the faith, having been blessed with the presidential seal of approval, were allowed to leave with heads held high, safe in the knowledge that America takes care of its own. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. I'm doing my best to refrain from commenting between everything in the open mic, so gratitude. Our next poet is Kellyanne Parker. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, all of you features were amazing. Um, the piece I'm gonna read is something that I wrote about five years ago as a birthday gift for somebody very special. Um, and for anyone in the queer community in the Bay Area, they know kin folks who started the um, Healing Arts Center and Queer Spectrum Media and is a home and a haven for the queer community and especially for those who are people of color. And um, they put out a challenge that they continually do and that is to um, challenge us to stop using the words light and dark and black and white for good and evil. And so um, this poem was a celebration of uh, both things dark and black in honor of this very special person in my life. And it's called The Beauty of the Dark for Kin Folks. There is beauty in the dark where our authentic selves reside and where true feelings flow unrestrained, not bubbling with superficiality. For in the darkness, feelings run deep. It's where the soul resides, not only for our outside lives, but where our inner lives occur. Like a welcome retreat from the scorching sun and unrestrained by censors, for in the darkness, we can't see with the limit of human eyes. It is there that we must be with the spiritual heart. And that intuitive pulse sees and feels much more than our imagination, free of chains and our eyes free of filters. For in order to truly see, we must first unsee. We must deprogram lies embedded deep in societal psyche. We must unbelieve in order to embrace beauty and believe. There is comfort in the dark, like a velvety blanket weighted, weighty with the richness of ancient history, where we have nothing to hide, but instead are revealed. That self that holds feeling deeper than can be explained. To fear the dark is to fear one's own true self, a paintbrush drenched and saturated, vibrant with colors as yet unseen and rich beyond words. Blackness is pure as nirvana, steeped in infinite power of galaxies and other worlds from where life springs like from the womb or like the origins of the universe 
in the beginning of time. Thank you. Thank you, Kellyanne Parker. Great to have you here with us today on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Please come back soon. And next is another poet that we've heard recent from recently. I just want to give a shout out to Carla Cherry because Carla just read in our new book showcase recently as well. So welcome back, Carla. Hi, Sandy, thank you. So uh, the poem I'm going to read is called Redress. Angela, wish I knew how, where to find you. Would you remember me or that I sat behind you in our eighth grade English class? As we discuss Animal Farm, other works of the Eurocentric canon, I studied the swell, twirls, twists of your two neat plaits. You were the only one of us who hadn't been seated, bent at the nape of the neck by the stove in her mother's kitchen or in Mrs. Johnson's salon, hot comb, Dax, blue magic, ultra sheen, or a dark and lovely cream relaxer scorching her coils into submission. Fed up with your confidence in revealing kinks and kitchens our mothers tried to hide, I asked you, why don't you straighten your hair? I remember your smile. You turned around, announced, my hair doesn't need to be straightened, and turned back to your work. Yes, it does, I snickered. I wish you had been there to see me at 18 when I heard Farrakhan accuse sisters and brothers who do things to our hair of being dissatisfied with the way God gave it to us. I was angry until I realized my shame of its texture and determined to never chemically alter it again. The day I walked down 125th Street, scarf secured around my head, strands springing forth, wrapped around each other like the roots of a mangrove when an African sister offered to braid my hair. I smiled through my no thank you, eyes affixed on the horizon when she asked, you're going to wear your hair like that? At 40, when I undid my last box braid, threw away my last plastic bag full of unraveled Kanekalong hair, at 46, when the last comb infiltrated my crown, I wish you could see me work my scalp, my hair over with witch hazel, water, peppermint oil. At 48, locks caress my shoulders. Yesterday, a little girl looked up at me, my locks framing my face. She said, you look pretty, I like your hair. It is what I should have said to you that day in class, though you never needed me to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Carla's new book. I, I, if I have your book, if I have a book with me, I, I will sh I show it. So, um, and I, I don't have tons of them because I'm not in my normal abode, but I happen to have Carla's new book. And there it is. Make sure you get it. Stardust and skin. Thank you. And next we have Rosaline Crowley. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, can you see me? Oh, okay, very good. Um, I'm, I'm really just in awe of, your, of the featured speakers. I really appreciate um, being here today. The poem I, I chose today is really one to say that we're all in this together. And I wrote this in, on a June day in 2020. And I hope it doesn't fall short, but it's, it's uh, what, what I have and what I have to give. It's called, uh, this, it's called Hawk on a June day, 2020. 
And just uh, to know that hawk is a symbol for the power to see and to have clear vision. And that's what I hope that I will have someday or I'm working towards. I saw hawk today, glorious, big bodied, landed on a branch, light footed and still. Using binocular vision without thinking, blinking, he surveyed the scene and heard my call to come. Look at this majestic bird. With speed and whooshing sound, he flew over the house and gone, gone to find food for nourishment, leaving me with food for thought. And just like the, the hawk, I take in the view. I accept the blame on this June day for not being more alert to white privilege. In future, I will know better. And like the hawk, I must respond to the lowest decibel with quick movement and seek to nourish myself and others with understanding past and present injustices. Feel the pain and seek forgiveness so I can hold out a, pen, a hand, put pen to paper and act in solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, well done. Act in solidarity. That is uh, why I'm here today. And um, thank you for that poignant reminder. It's Rosaline Crowley. And next we have Ken Holland. Hello. Hello. Greetings all. But the, the features, language and craft and lessons learned and of course, lessons not yet learned. Uh, this is called Take a Knee. All I wanted to do was watch an old black and white film with you, but the black had been stripped away. Bogart kissing some woman's white lips, Cagney stroking his white Tommy gun, Gary Cooper wiping down the white sweat of his white horse. Mae West casting back her sultry look asking, why don't you white boys come up and see me sometime? And all those war movies with their white bombs and white blood and that last hill the white GIs have got to take from the unseen colorless enemy. And it's the best part. It's the scene you've seen so many times before and here it comes again. You can't get enough of it. Your knuckles gone white, skin gone white, breath gone white from how long you've held that breath. Watching wars, white smoke, white bullets, white fear. Your breath held for nine white minutes as if beneath a knee that doesn't know the scene has ended. Though the credits have begun to roll as your heart beats back to red and the screen fades to black. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken Holland. And I want to um, give a shout out that Ken is going to be reading in our new book showcase on July 11th with actually our next reader, Teresa Gallion, who just had a tremendous birthday book launch party this past week. So congratulations. And I'm looking forward to seeing the both of you on July 11th. Thank you, Sandy. Ancestral regression. African drums beat on the trail of tears, flooding the ancestors' lips, recalling a journey across the sea of pain, the pain of chains pinching ankles, wrists, and necks, chokeholds suffocating crowded bodies in the dungeons of hell. The drum beats tell a story of every tribesman who jumped ship on an air break. Ancestral blood waves hissed across the sea, each time death retreated from the bounty. Some tribesmen suck air to take back to hell's holding tank, not knowing their next stop, the auction block of the Americas. Warm bodies went to the plantations of hell, worked 
where you worked hard against the whip of the sun and the overseer's lash. From sun up to sundown, six days a week. Even in hell, you were allowed to sing on Sunday. Good care of the property was a necessity. Hell's hounds addicted to meat got treats from every piece of property, daring to run the woods surrounding the masses fields. The high threat of death was not enough to stop the risk for freedom. Broken bodies brought back blatant lessons to instill fear in the heart. Death, survival, always the question. And life rolled up on in the dirt floored shanties behind the big house. Freedom was the dream for the next generation. The colored man's slavery moved from the shanty to the sharecropper's rented space, working masses fields to pay his eternal debts. Still, hope would simmer in the hearts and be passed to the next generation. Oh, children of the southern night, swimming in tears, reach for hope, elusive hope. Hope, don't leave the children, send them north, send them east, send them west, break the chains to the masses fields. So the elders struggled on in the southern fields and children faced oppression again, just as severe, severe in the ghettos of the north, the east, the west. The elders did not know the scar of color was a rejection ticket all across the Americas, but hope was painted on the children's breast and their time was on the horizon. Tired and weary for freedom, they refused to sit on the back of the bus, insisted on sitting at the lunch counter, suffered the humiliation of desegregation and marched the white pavement chanting for freedom. We shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. The chant reigned across the Americas. The theory of nonviolence met the whip of abuse and they chose freedom now a death marching beside Jews and Gentiles who believed freedom belonged to all souls. O oh, children of the Southern night, your memory fades from whence you came. Your elders cry for you on the steps of heaven. Where is your compassion gone? Where is your caring for your family gone? Where is the hand out for your brother and your sister? Where is your courage to carry each other on your backs? Listen, listen, listen children, listen to the cries of your ancestors. Thank you. I'm listening. Thank you. That was Teresa Gallion. And next is one of her neighbors, <laughs> Holly Wilson. Hi, thank you so much. It's so good to be here. I've been meaning to come for a long time. I'm so glad I finally made it. You're such a gracious host S. And I just loved hearing the um, featured readers today. So thank you very much. I do host um, an open poetry reading, the Tortuga Gallery open poetry reading, third Wednesday evening, seven to 9 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. I put my email in the chat if you want to uh, email me and get on my list um, and join that reading. So I have a little poem from Down on the Farm. Some of you know that I own a little farm and some of my poems are inspired by that. This is called The Color of Eggs. I'm an egg farmer. I raise chickens to sell their eggs. I purposely have a variety of breeds that each lay a different color egg. Chocolate brown, adobe brown, dark tan, light tan, cream, white, blue, green, and even olive. I purposely fill each carton with eggs of the greatest diversity possible and purposely arrange them so they are an evenly mixed as possible, 
creating a visually pleasing array. I call them my rainbow eggs. My motto, we treat each egg as an individual. As I place eggs in their cartons, I cannot help but notice how nice the white ones look when surrounded by so many eggs of color. Thank you. Thank you, Holly Wilson. I'm so glad to have you here with us today. And, you know, I don't give enough shout outs to all my uh, siblings who are running those reading series all around the world. Um, I know folks, in fact, so Holly Wilson is one of them and our next reader is another one, the artful Dodger himself, Harvey Sauce. Harvey may have had to leave the reading. Um, I'm sorry if that's the case, but you were seeing things in the chat. So I'm gonna go next to, uh, we're gonna go to Colorado and Kate Weggerson. Hello and thank you so much. What a wonderful, wonderful day of readers and um, our hearts and our feelings to people that um, are going through so much and still here with us. I'm gonna hold up this picture. I don't know if you can see me, um, but this picture came across. Let's see. Okay. It's a bunch of wonderful people. They are out on the street. Sorry, I don't know how to skip the shift, but this is a photo by Bob Coratori. And this is Maxwell Street, Sunday Gospel, circa 1960s. <clears throat> I grew up being told that taught to recognize the limited mind and heart of the prejudiced and to avoid the cruelty of those of superiority. But when I was back in my suburban life, I was told, you need to learn your place. What's wrong with you? And when I heard that, it was then I knew that the matriarch in my family's credo came shining through. We are all God's children. This is a short anaphora from seeing this wonderful picture of people gathered in gospel jazz. Blessings to all the people and places where I felt a welcome, where my sad face was comforted with a smile where the song of the soul rose, where music was praise, where rhythm aligned movement, where expression of life's joy lived, where I was not to go to that place of inclusion, where my eyes learned to spark, where my voice learned to speak, where all the hope is prepared for the next day. Thank you. Thank you, Kate Legrizen. And we go next to Max Vanderstein. Hello. Hello, Sandra. It's so nice to see you. And thank you for including me with all these great voices here this afternoon. It's a it's an honor to be able to read with them. Um, I'd like to read a poem out of my book here, Work of Words, which is about some tragic events that happened um, were perpetrated by a Canadian mining company on the uh, indigenous people of Central America. And it's called Global Watch. Brother, do you know what time it is? My gold watch tells me what time it is in Canada. Brother, do you care what time it is? Does your gold watch tell you what time it is in Guatemala? Where the calendar runs out, nor matters much to Diodora and the Mayans in San Miguel, Ixtahuacan, and at its solstice, 
the shadow of the serpent dives now deep into the earth. Where the Mam and Sycopensi families drink the shrinking groundwater tainted now with cyanide by the government alchemists, transforming dirt into money and undermining the ground of generations surrendered to the sluice of changing times. Where the gnomic indigenous culture is pitted against giant industrial corporations who are digging a hole in the land and the heart of the mines. Where the lingering images of limbless children, saddened, miscarrying mothers and eyeless women, lesioned skin and disillusioned kin and vacant expressions of alienated men contrast the portrait of promise contained in the Sierra Madre Foundation. Where the objecting voices are all quieted, wrongly construed as consent, and the stacked tribunals do deliberate wrongly what they believe to benefit. Where the true miscarriage is justice, and the heavy metals and heavy hands of Marlin excavate and execute, raise the earth and haze the worth of a golden civilization. Brother, can you tell me what time it is in Guatemala? When politicians comply with 5% royalty as stakeholders in the land, and people are ravaged and provide 95% profit for foreign owners manipulating the mantle of their vassalage. When the absence of communal consent is preempted, voices are unheard and entreaties go ignored. Backs and hearts are broken, lands and homes are sold. Dialogue means more than just a question of language. Extraction is a dubious multifaceted process and civilization is unearthed all in the name of gold. When there is no question of the dissension, is it not time to question the intentions? Brother, can you tell me what time it is in Canada when politicians shamelessly fly like royalty with shareholders of Gold Corp International to witness the procession of the removal and renewal in the colonial hinterlands of ore? When foreign aid is only mentioned in reducing percentages, opportunities are now provisional and the people thereby ransomed. Pacts and promises are broken. Laws and loans are on hold. Justice is more than just a matter of dialogue. Exportation is a dubious, shady process, and civilizations grow unequal, all in the name of gold. When there is no question of the injustice, it is not time to question their trust in us. Brother, can you tell me what time this is? What was that golden rule? Thank you. Thank you so much. Max Vanderstein, and you know, I want to, and I want to particularly thank those folks who are reading with us for the first time today. I know there's a couple of you, and it's been very special to have your voices as part of this um, Black Lives Matter Black History Month celebration today on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Very grateful. Well, talk about gratitude. Um, Next, we will hear from Don Krieger. It's a pleasure and a joy to be here. Gaslight, a psychological thriller in four parts. Late term betrayal. There are no slaves. Anyone that sets foot here becomes free. Men and women are equal before the law. Hang on for a second, let me do this. Men and women are equal before the law. Article 19, Pinochet's constitution. Our fathers swore at our nation's conception, all men are created equal with unalienable rights, life, liberty, and 23 years later, they aborted their oath, signed a constitution which denied those rights to women, native people, slaves, forsaking eternal truth. Whiteness is all colors. Even Chile's tyrant did better. Martha's dowry and George's will. 
He was one of the few who was not carried away by power, Robert Frost. He was 11, heir to the family farm and 10 slaves. Later that year, he bought eight more and yet another seven as a young man. He lived three generations. At his death, he owned 123 and 153 more. Martha's dowry doubled in their 20-year marriage. His and hers, hers hostage to the law destined for return to her first husband's heirs. George's death freed his own, though he left it to Martha to sign their deeds. He was our first king in all but name, principled and elegant, said Abigail Adams. Afterward, from the writing workshop. One, it's didactic. Two, how many times did someone post the same thing on Twitter today? Three, it tells me what to think. Four, I can't tell if the piece is meant to undercut or support the Frost quote. These from four of the five men present. The fifth abruptly left the, the workshop as I read the poem. When he called me the next day, one, it's not poetry. Two, you disrespect the father of our country. Three, Henry Hyams and Judah Benjamin were Jews and Confederate government officials. Most people owned slaves, and you would have too. Four, we ended slavery in less than 100 years. That's an extraordinary accomplishment. Five, it's hate speech. I asked about this last. His answer, it's didactic. I urged him, you really should read White Fragility. I had given him a copy last year. He responded, I couldn't understand it. Anyway, my girlfriend is African-American. My dear friend, if we had sat together in a Berlin cafe, on that black election day in 32, sharing our art, laughing and learning. I know you would have spoken for evil, though the beast and his brown shirts were weaker then than ours are now. Would you still have spoken so in 33 when their mad master, so like ours, triumphed? or weeks later when their capital burned, or the next day when their Patriot Act passed, or the next month when their Manzanar opened. What say you now, so like then, just weeks since our president's darlings, the uncolored beasts swarmed our Reichstag? Which of us will pick up your tab this time, and what will it be? When is the end of friendship? Will you speak for the monsters still, tender yet again the caress of your madness to all of us who love you? Thank you so much, Don Krieger. And I'm gonna read the final poem for today's open mic. Um, and I was gonna maybe read one of my own. Um, I was gonna read a poem for D. Allen called After the Election, Oakland Burns Down about the ghost ship, but I'm gonna, I'll read it another time. And then I was also, I thought about reading a poem for my really, really dear friend, 
Cabby Mitchell, who was the first African American um, principal dance ballet dancer in the in the Pacific Northwest, who passed away in 2017. But I'm going to save that for another day too. But I got his voice. I got his name in today. So that's for my dear Cabby. But I'm going to read a poem, which was one of I thought the most astounding books of 2000. Um, 18, and I actually really thought it should have won the National Book Award in poetry. Maybe, maybe it did, and maybe I'm wrong about it. But, um, and that is Terence Hayes's American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin. And every poem in this book is called American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin just so you know that. So this is one of them. And I'll, I'll take a page out of D. Allen's book and tell you, this is American Sonnet for my past and future assassin on page 71. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. It was discovered the best way to comfort sadness was to make your sadness adore or make it an envelope of wireless chatter or wires pulled from the radio tape recorder. Your mother bought you for Christmas in 1984. If you think a hammer is the only way to hammer a nail, you ain't thought of the nail correctly. My problem was I declared, I decided to make myself a poem. It made me sweat in private selfishly. It made me bleed, bleep, and weep for health. As a poem, I could show my children the man I dreamed I was, my mother and father, my half brothers, the lovers I lost. Just mourning as a poem, I asked myself if I was going to weep today. American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin from the just astounding poet, Terence Hayes. If you're not familiar, again, another book to add to your collection, 2018 from um, Pittsburgh Press. Yes, University of Pittsburgh, I believe. Well, I want to thank everyone for reading in our open mic today celebrating Black Lives Matter and Black History Month. I really appreciate everyone who came out to read in the open mic. Let me say your names. Um, Ahmed Dahia Badsha, Susie Crandall, Sylvia Ramos Cruz, Jesse Ehrenberg, Kelly Ann Parker, Carla Cherry, Rosaline Crowley, Ken Holland, Teresa Gallion, Holly Wilson, Kate Wegerson, Max Vandersteen, Don Krieger, and a poem from your host, but really from Terrence Hayes. And also a colossal, magnanimous, magnificent thank you to our featured poets, Gary Copeland Lilly, Tamara J. Madison, Martina McGowan, Lauren Russell, and D. Allen. How about we unmute for a moment and give everyone a really, you know, shout out, round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank, thank you, you all. Amazing. <laughs> really amazing. Thank you. Well, just a few announcements. Um, a reminder that we should never, ever limit the understanding of a history of a people to just one month. The more we embrace all histories daily in connection and in context, the more we embrace all humanity. And isn't this at least in part, if in fact not in full, what poetry is about? Mm -hmm.
I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And thanks to Don Krieger, of course, with whom none of this would be possible. We also had help today, assistance support from Kim Ports Parsons and a belated birthday to co-founder Elizabeth Ann. With a reminder, everyone, join us next week, please, on Sunday, March 7th, with our live poetry open mic to celebrate Women's History Month and International Women's Day, which is the next day on March. You're, You're muted. muted. You're muted. You're, You're muted, muted, Sandy. Muted. You're muted, Sandy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I hit it. Okay, um, a reminder, we have our live open mic to celebrate Women's History Month and International Women's Day next week. International Women's Day is Monday, March 8th. And in two weeks, please come back for our new book showcase with Lucy Adkins, Ellen Stone, Michael Jurak joining us from Limerick, Ireland and Sandra Winters. Well, everybody, that's it for today and um, tonight, wherever you are, my dear friends, um, those of you here with us in Zoom and those of you who've been watching us live on Facebook and those of you, of course, who will be watching this uh, very special edition of Cultivating Voices live poetry on the recording that will appear shortly um, on YouTube and on Facebook. I'll see you soon around Zoom. From my seaside nook here in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, I bid you all ahoy, safe travels, and please, please keep writing. <clears throat> Thank you, Sandy.